conventional soldier. A military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Unconventional Soldier podcast, which aims to record the history of the British Army's STA Patrols Unit through the voices of the veterans who served in its ranks. Today, Kevin and I are talking to Danny Kay, who served with the battery from the mid-90s, working through the ranks, and was recently Battery Sergeant Major until further promotion. He was in one of the early selection courses run in the UK, when the unit relocated to Catrick from Germany, and these courses were different to those that took place during the Cold War, as it was in order to cater for the ever-evolving STA role. On this pod, we'll cover the content of that new course, the changes made over the years, and the type of person applying. As normal, we will start with our guest military biography, leading up to when they volunteered for the selection course. So, Danny, what year did you join up, and what year did you come to uh, 473? Well, I think, Kev, if uh, I had to look back uh, just before I joined, so... Um probably looking back at when I, I first came over to the country. Um, I left South Africa in 95, during, just after the apartheid uh, era, um, and then came over and did a bit of schooling down in Somerset <laughs> before I said, oh, I've had enough of this, so I'll join, um, I'll join the army. And it was purely probably because of my dad's background uh, in the army. So... Um, I went to the recruiting office in Taunton um, and then effectively joined in 97 and then went to the battery um, straight to Five Ridge in 98. So, so you're lucky, mate, you never end up with a hybrid West Country, South African accent. <laughs> yeah, the Somerset one. But, uh, I mean, as I said, I, I was just going to back when uh, – the reason I joined is probably because of my father um, and his military history uh, on that and my grandfather's military history uh, as my, my father was British. He was a British citizen born in Sheffield. So what, what regiment was your dad in then, Danny? Well, funny enough, he uh, – well, it's, it's not funny really. Uh, he, 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 he served in the Second World War. So uh, he passed away about seven years ago uh, now um, at the age of 92. But um, – a news article uh, that mentioned my dad when he got hit uh, in a minesweeper uh, back then um, in um, in uh, Dunkirk. During that time, he um, I think what, what he said at that time he said he he said um, he got saved by the bodies that were piled onto him, so he got shrapnel wounds to the neck, and um, he ended up surviving that. Uh, his first regiment he probably joined, if I go back further than that, his first regiment was uh, the Royal Artillery. I can't remember exactly what regiment it was at that time, but uh, he then uh, went on to join three para and then the SAS uh, after the war. What year did he get into Hereford? Uh, it was shortly after the war, so I, I can't recollect what he actually said when it was after, but he served in there and then... He served in which, which was two one SAS at the time, the original SAS, um, and then moved on to the Rhodesian SAS um, from there um, in in the mid seventies, and then fought in the Rhodesian War. Um, oh, okay. Before um, moving over to South Africa and serving in the Parabats. Did he ever tell you much of his experiences, or did he keep it quite quiet? Uh, he told me bits and pieces. He told me more. He, he didn't really talk about the war that much. Uh, I mean, he, he did. He didn't mention some funny stories about him getting captured in the Second World War and then escaping in that uh, during that part, uh, probably in the late 1940s. But remember, he joined. He he was 14 years old, working in the coal mines in Sheffield. So there was not much going on at that time, as you can imagine. Um, and then obviously the war kicked off. So he joined the army around about this. He's 17 years old. So mm. he wasn't 18 yet before he went out. Most of his life he's been in between uh, wars by the by the sounds of it and what he told me. Grandfather was in the Gurkhas, but he was born in India. Uh, I don't know too much about my grandfather's history, military uh, history on that, but I know he, he served in the Gurkhas as an officer then. Um, and then me joining the Royal Artillery was just by a coincidence. Um, it wasn't 
I suppose the the guy who was recruiting me at the time was uh, um, artillery background, and they ended up in my original my original um, sort of posting, if you want to call it that. Um, my original sort of selection process was to go down the two nine commando route, so the artillery commandos. I uh, changed my changed my um, my posting when I got into training because of uh, one of my friends uh, was going to 473. And I knew nothing about 473 at the time. I had no clue. Um, obviously, coming from South Africa and thinking I was going to be put in the bundus or the bush, was well, it wasn't. So it was uh, quickly realized that, you know, I was uh, a rabbit in the headlights when I was going through training. Yeah, my friend persuaded me, and I ended up n- knowing nothing about 473 and what they did. Ended up at Five Ridges Gate. As as a young eighteen year old, well, seventeen and a half year old at that point. Did you tell your old man what you were doing at the time, and did he try and influence your army career in any way? Uh, yeah. So he was he was back in South Africa at the time. I phoned him up. Uh, we had a short conversation. It was like, why are you joining the artillery? <laughs> um, <laughs> I was just like, I don't know, Dad. I'm just joining the artillery. Um, he didn't call you a hat because he was ex-Power Rays. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. He said, why aren't you joining the Paris? But it, it, he actually it, asked you that question? Yeah, he did, yeah. Oh, right. But he didn't, he didn't call me a hat at the time. He just said, why are you joining the artillery? Um, and it just, it just and I, I was just like, oh, it's got more to offer, you know, just being young and naive. Um, I'm not saying the artillery is bad at all, but, uh, yeah, I was just young and naive at that time. But no, I, I think that's an interesting point because picking up on a couple of things you said, I think when I went along to the recruiting office, it was a Royal Artillery bloke there that re- recruited me. And, and I think a lot of guys do end up in the troop because I think they want to do an infantry-type job, you know, and when I... I wanted to, I was in the air defence regiment, I wanted to get out of it. But then back in my day, you couldn't transfer. And the only way to get out of it was to go in the OP troop selection course. So I do think a lot of guys that go for selection are probably frustrated infantrymen. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right in that way. Yeah, so as I said, yeah, my original posting was uh, to head off to the All, All Arms Commander course, but it wasn't that. Um, and as I said, I turned up at, at the gate in 97 and started the course in 98. And believe it or not, Kev was my instructor at the time. So what, what did you know uh, about the course before you joined? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I didn't know anything about the course. The only way I found, I think it was one of my instructors at phase two, no, correction, phase one, pulled me to a side and said, do, do you know, because I changed my, my posting preference, so where I wanted to go. Hmm. Uh, and it was, he said, that you, do you know what you're going into? And I was kind of, you know, being arrogant and that, I suppose, the South African and me, yeah, I know what I'm going into. But actually, I didn't have a clue what I was going into, to be fair. And he, he highlighted it's not it's not an easy course, it's arduous, you know what I mean? It's quite because mm. he's got friends in there. Um, so he gave me a bit of an insight uh, after talking to him, uh, but nothing nothing in detail. I, did, I mean, everyone was just like, you just live in holes, and that's all I got. And I think it's a big ask for a, a young soldier going from phase two because we back in the sort of the late eighties we were having trouble recruiting. We we took a load of guys in from sort of basic training straight out of it, and a few of them passed and all good guys, but most of them failed because I think it's a big ask of a young soldier because if you go and do P Company or the Commando course, a lot of the time you get carried along by the group. And I'm, I'm not being disparaging saying that, but on the four seven three battery course. You expect to do a lot of stuff on your own, a lot of the marches on your own, a lot of the fitness tests on your own, and even just operating on on your own and on the exercise. So I think it's a lot to ask for a young eighteen, nineteen year old soldier. Yeah, I think I think people expect you to just be to be quite an experienced soldier for our course. So when you turned up, you could navigate. Um, you were self resilient. You you could operate on your own. You didn't need all those basic bits and pieces that I think. Uh, the experience you gain over the first couple of years in the armed forces, exercises, and all the rest of it. So, I think, I think the, and as we'll talk about later in the podcast, those things did change a little bit. We changed the course to meet those uh, needs a little bit, but it'll still be quite hard to come from straight from phase two, do a, a very very short beat up, and then go on to the selection phase. Were you the only phase two guy on the course that you went on, Danny? 
No, I wasn't actually. Um, it, there was uh, there was a few of us actually, and I can't remember exactly. Uh, I think the course was, and Kev will be able to, uh, you know, correct me. Uh, um, I think there was around forty uh, on our course on the initial sort of intake, but initially we did. I think it was about, uh, you know, I got there early, so we did about you know four or five four or five months build up training. Which yeah. I found that was quite intensive, if if you remember, Kev. Um, yeah. But I think there was around forty of us, not not phase two, but from all over. I think there was about maybe ten from no, probably ten. I think I don't know, Look, Kev. Yeah, there was a phase of we were people were getting posted in for the course, and there were varying periods. So a lot of people got posted in just before the course, and then they went on the course. But there was various people from phase two from other places that were getting posters quite early. And so there was a almost like a holding troop. And they, uh, they do exactly the same down seven from two and nine. And it was an opportunity to start doing some more of the basics and start building people up. But naturally, if they really wanted to be there, they'd stay. Some people didn't, even in the holding phase, we had a few people go. Um, I take that, it, Kev, you're concentrating on basic fitness. Yeah, navigation fitness, fitness. navigation skills, yeah. weapon handling skills. Yeah, all that real basic thing. stuff just to bring everyone up to a, a same line. Um, because the difference, and again, as we go through, the difference I think from the course that Danny was on to the course that we were on was we were select out courses. Their course was selecting trainable. The idea being to bring them along all the way through the course so you get a really good product at the end who will then go on to continuation training and gain and you're experience. not away guys with, with no absolutely because, because there was loads of people that could do the job if they had the chance rather than on ours if you couldn't do it then you went you were you you know because we had the straight away the, the first week was that was the the selection week wasn't it you turned up got beasted and for those that didn't feel met the grade or made a really silly or simple mistake they were thrown out yeah. I, I mean listening to the previous podcasts and uh, you know Obviously, the course was run in Germany, so there's, you know, a very different in terms of, as you said, Kev, you know, not selecting in, but <laughs> trying to get rid of as many people as possible. And I'm not saying that was on my course, but it certainly felt like it on, on the selection course um, mm. at that time. But it, know, I, th it, I think it's very easy to misinterpret select in, Danny. Uh, 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 and just to clarify to listeners, what we mean by select in is 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 – uh, not doing stupid things to fail people, which has essentially happened, you know, because at the end of the day, it's still a selection course. And if you don't meet the standards, yeah. you're out. But what you're not getting done is, is failed for, for, for stupid things, you know. And back in those days, when there was 155,000 people in the army, you know, you could get away with it. But, you know, but now the army's down to such few numbers, you, you've got to be a bit clever about how you select people. Yeah, yeah, you, you, definitely. I mean, on our course, you had things about the body body system. And if your buddy went into the woods to the toilet and he didn't take his buddy with him, you both got failed because it was a simple basic instruction. And if you can't do the basic instructions, then you won't be able to do the complex ones when you're tired. And so they had a very, very base level strictness that we didn't adopt when we did the courses um, post-Cold War as we moved on to the STA courses. So how many people out of that 40 got through in your course, Danny? Uh, there was seven of us. Um, <laughs> there you go, seven out yeah. of forty. So. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> it's the same yeah, dirty old half dozen. Yeah, course, seven. It's the dirty half dozen. I think we lost, uh, if I can remember rightly, we lost thirteen in the first two weeks because uh, we used to do we used to do basic patrols uh, first. Uh, what I can remember, so the patrolling skills first, and then med week, and then the test week. But in that sort of basic patrols, you did. Uh, I think uh, we did individual navving on that on the back area in, in Catrick at that time. But yeah, so yeah, we um, built our navigation that way, and then we were put on. You know, the first time we saw that our test routes or you know test week at, at that time was what we called it um, was uh, up in Northumbria, and that was the first time. But yeah. other than that, we you know we didn't see the test route so. And that you was know, deliberate. It's, it's, we wanted to keep you away from the test routes. So everything was done in uh, Catrick, build you up, get people faster, get the navigation skills better. But what we wanted that when you arrived on the test routes was 
It wasn't just a fitness run because you knew the routes. You had to navigate. Yeah. Especially as you went up and down because it was the mist and all the rest of it. And the idea was if you were unfamiliar, it made the routes, I'd say, a little bit harder because you had to work at it. And it was harder to follow each other as well. Yeah, yeah. You certainly had to work on your navigation, especially when the, the, the fog was in at that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, definitely. Um, so just interestingly, Danny, out of those, those, those guys that failed, how many sort of failed themselves or were failed because they never met a, a, a standard time for the tab or whatever? I, I would say the, the the vast majority, probably about, you know, more than 50% actually uh, voluntary withdrawal. So yeah. it comes off the, the course rather than being failed at that time. And, and, the, reason, and, the reason I bring that up is for civilian listeners because we've got quite a few civil listeners and it, it's hard to get across to them that on a lot of these courses, the danger point is when you've got time to think and chew over your mistakes and a lot of people just psych themselves out of, they've probably got the ability, but they psych, they psych themselves out of it. Would you think that's true? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, and, and that is, you know, half the, and even today's courses are like, a, there's a lot of people that actually, you know, this is not for me or they get cold and wet and they don't, they can't, it's a mental resilience nowadays. Um, and I think it also goes back to when you guys did the course as well, it's that mental resilience to get through something and you know that, you know, it's got to end sometime. And I think that's what some people don't realize it has got to end, but, or they just realize it's not for me or I'm not cut out for it. And and you, you generally find that when you go into the field, so when you're doing your exercises in the field in terms of uh, your soldiering exercises, so you know, you, your OP work and living in those conditions, um, which have an adverse effect on your, you know, your mental resilience and your body, but you can get through that. Yeah, you can, mate. And I think also another thing I, I sort of found when I'm on these type of courses is that even amongst the students, pretty soon you, you can realize who the idiots are. <laughs> And you tend to self-select within the group as well. Did you find that on your own course? You know, there's people you didn't want to do tasks with or didn't want paired up with. Did you find yourself? Uh, yeah, there were that the, sort of thing the, as well. Yeah, there were a few individuals, um, and probably some to uh, well, some of our listeners will be listening now and and thinking, yeah, I was on the same course, going, yeah, I know who those individuals were, and uh, and. Uh, I know, Kev. There were some individuals that, you know, you, you have a personality clash with and you don't mm. get on with. Or some individuals that are just take the easy option, you know, coasting in the back instead of actually taking that leadership role when they should be because, they've, you know, they're, they're, more, they're more experienced um, in that side because they've been in the Army slightly longer than I had been in the Army, you know what I mean, which was like two minutes at that point. But yeah, it was, that's a good good point though, Danny, because Kevin and I mentioned this in previous podcasts in that if you get an NCO turned up, he's judged to a higher standard yeah. because of the experience, yeah. because of the rank he holds, and he's actually expected to do better than maybe a young soldier like yourself um, out of training. So there is more expected of him. Just because you've achieved a pass rate as a young soldier, he's expected to achieve a higher standard as well. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was definitely the case. I, I think when we reviewed the course as we're going through each phase and we look at the um, performance of each individual, we did gauge it in some ways. It wasn't just a, a single line, but as an NCO, because they're going to go into the patrol as an NCO, they're not going to go into the patrol as a gunner. Um, they were expected to operate at a, high, uh, a slightly higher level. Same, same make the same mistakes and all the rest of it, but we expected them to show a little bit more because they were already recognised, because they were already promoted as a junior leader in some states so we expect them to perform on the course in the same way yeah. so we've discussed a bit about the course now so i think we'll go on to the main part of the podcast now and for listeners who might be coming to this podcast for the first time in here in this one in pod three we discussed the early selection courses designed for the cold war so if you haven't had a chance rewind and have, have a listen to that and that will sort of put things in the bigger picture for you so the course uh, Danny attended was developed from the stay behind concept, but it brought in the STA patrols element, the surveillance and target acquisition patrols element, which was developed prior to the Balkans and which shaped the continuity training. It was also worth pointing out that up to 1991, the selection course chief instructor was posted down from the parachute regiment. 
But from 91 up until the early 2000s, we're fortunate enough to have a highly experienced warrant officer from 2-2 Special Air Service as the chief instructor. And this played a large part in moulding the content of the course as we switched to the surveillance and target acquisition role that has predominated since. So, Danny, can you outline the structure of the course you attended in the late 90s and how it compares to the current SDA course, please? Yeah, um, well... So as I said before, um, the course started, we started with 42, the, the sort of day one or the first week was uh, your combat fitness test. So you, your mandatory um, physical assessments, um, which was con uh, which included a CFT at that time. So a combat fitness test, which is uh, a weighted march over eight miles uh, within two hours. Uh, and and that's just a standard army test, isn't it? Yeah, very... st standard army test. Um, that it's it's an annual test that everyone had to pass. Um, you know, uh, to show that they've got the physical aptitude for that. But uh, covered with the at that time, it's slightly changed nowadays. But um, we did the BFT, which is uh, the basic fitness test, which is a mile and a half run and uh, 10 and a half, but we had to do it in nine and a half uh, minutes. Uh, so that was with boots as well uh, at that time. Um, so those are sort of you, and, and then a, a swim test, a military swim test, because you, you had to know how to swim if you were doing river crossings and that. And, um, so they had to be ticked off as well, uh, which is not dissimilar to nowadays, to be fair. Um, and these are nothing really. I mean, any soldier, you should be able to go into a barracks and pick a soldier off the parade square or march around camp and just say, do these tests. And they, any soldier should be able to pass them quite easily. It's yeah. surprising how many people turn up on these courses, these selection courses, and can't. Yeah, no, the, yeah, yeah. For the listeners, yeah, it, it is, as I said, it's just a, it, it was an annual assessment to see your physical aptitude. Um, and to make sure that you're hitting those uh, fitness um, standards within the army. And those are just your basic standard physical assessments. Uh, warrant that, you know, when we did the course, we did it in a day, um, which hasn't changed, to, to be fair, today, nowadays. Um, and as I, as I mentioned slightly there, we uh, went in straight into the patrolling phase, which um, Kev's actually covered a bit about. We um, started with uh, basic navigation, but we were in the field for the first two weeks, um, if I rightly remember, uh, covering basic soldiering, which is how to use your weapon, how to patrol in four-man teams and six-man teams, how to patrol tactically, how to you know evade the enemy in terms of when in a contact uh, effectively as a team. So work as a small team as an as a unit, um, and that encompassed your. Um, you know your your sentry positions, building up harbor positions. So for the listeners, um, your stag positions, um, and also where where you're gonna covertly hide as well uh, as a team. So those two weeks were basically our build up phase, I would say, and we moved from there into individual navexes. Um, there was uh, after the sort of third week. Uh, living in the field, we did a, another uh, combat fitness test in eight miles just to see our bodies coped living on, on rations as well. Uh, so I think we were carrying about 25 kilograms, so straight off out the field um, onto a eight-mile run, which is uh, living on rations does uh, drain the body as well. Um, during those, those three weeks uh, – sorry, those two weeks we did uh, – log races, stretch races. Um, the PSI at the time was um, a Hereford 2-2 uh, um, SAS um, guy who was, you know, warranty was uh, called Monster Adams, um, who was, he was, uh, well, if someone's calling him a monster, then th there's a reason behind it. Um, he was a bit of a monster when it came to in the field craft, but, but yeah, moving on straight after that, after that sort of uh, sort of two weeks, we went straight into um, our med week, followed by um, which med week covered. Um, we had a doctor in covering uh, IV drills, so um, 
putting cannulas into our arms, um, advanced stuff for advanced forces, um, how to survive, you know, on our own with a four-man team, basically. And then, which tied in nicely onto the heels phase because we'd done some med training if, in case we did come into, uh, you know, a bit of problems on the heels on our own when we started doing test week. And then we went straight into test week. And those Danny, that... Oh, sorry, sorry, mate. Can I just jump in to ask, yeah. to ask Kev a question? Because Kev mm-hmm. was part of the direction staff the yes at that time. What what was the, the the choice in doing the test the physical test week so far into the course because you've already invested quite a lot of time training these guys what what was this, the reason behind that Kev Well, not everyone got the um, not everyone was in the holding troop so basically the course we had uh, the first couple of weeks was basically build up because what we found was people were arriving they either weren't boot fit they weren't Bergen fit not to the right level. And they couldn't navigate as well as they should. So we were, we were losing people with just sore feet because they just hadn't built up. So, so we got into this point. sort of hardening yeah, their bodies yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and improving was, their navigation it, it skills. Was, it was getting them to that level of fitness. And also, because things were starting to change, we need to make sure before we put someone on the hills, not a burn, and say, go to that checkpoint. If we hadn't tested them beforehand that they were fit enough, that's why we did so many CFTs to the achieve a certain level, that the the marches across Catrick as individuals were slowly getting faster. So the first day, the timings were getting tighter. So we sped them up a little bit. And Catrick's not as hilly as obviously Otterburn. And also we had to get um, an assurance piece that they could actually navigate. Because the last thing we wanted to happen was put them into Otterburn, they go go get lost somewhere. And then we end up spending the rest of the week searching for that person because they're missing with mountain rescue. The idea was to make sure that we felt confident the person could start be at the start point, day or night, depending on the route, and could achieve the speed desired and with the navigation. Because it didn't matter how fit you was, if you couldn't navigate, you're just not going to get round. And it's just a waste then putting people on the hills. Okay. So it was about thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, thanks yeah. for clearing that up, mate. Sorry, Danny, I did interrupt you there, mate. No, no, it's all right. Um, as Kev said, yeah, we went – yeah, all I can remember at that time was, uh, you know, because I was young and naive, um, is sticking a Bergen on and someone saying, yeah, you're going here um, and off you went. So with your Bergen and your rifle, off I went. Um, you know, that, and if obviously the, the fog came in, then you had to rely on um, all the mist, you had to rely on your navigation and your bearing and that. But the, the challenge that, you know, the sort of tests that were involved was, you know, day one was a 10 miler. Um, and you had to, in those days, we had to complete that 10 miler to carry on further on the hills um, mm. because that was a safety. Because if you weren't achieving that time, then you're not going to achieve the rest of the, the, the individual Navixes, yeah. so mm. the navigation tests. Um, so that was a benchmark for the sort of instructors and the DS to go, yeah, he's safe to carry on. Um, so in some ways they mitigated the risk for um, us as individuals and saying, yeah, he's good to go for the next phase. Um, and then it's followed by an 18K and a 22K and a, a and then a 40-kilometer um, endurance march. So if, if you failed either of those, each time you went on one of these tests, if you failed it, that was that you were removed from the course, were you? No, the first one was uh, a pass or fail. The the rest were um, if you could have a bad day and you're allowed a bad day. So you know you got a red card, which which I mean is a is a warning. Don't fail another one. So if you failed two, then yes, you were off the course because you didn't have the you know the physical aptitude to carry on. Uh, so generally, you know, most people. That have one red card because you do have a bad. You put in your body every day, putting a a, a, um, a backpack for those uh, listeners out there on the back of your back and and running around, which is quite a. It has a toll on your body. Um, and at that time, we used to travel at, at zero three in the morning up to Northumbria in the back of a, a Bedford at that time. And I think Kev was a driver as well, so you did try and get your your head well. Try and get some sleep, but 
not with um, cabs driving. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you were like given a route and then off you go, um, basically. Um, it was a bit of a haze for me at that time because I was quite young. But, you know, we finished the endurance and then we were back down uh, Catrick again. And then it, I don't know whose idea it was, but then they gave us logs to do a, a log race. Uh, which you can imagine your legs weren't moving that quickly after being on the hills after endurance. So uh, the, the, the day after the 40 kilometers. Yeah, so endurance. it was, yeah. So it was a day after. <laughs> um, and by that time, we didn't, we didn't really have, uh, we lost quite a few people at that time. Uh, and I can't even remember the exact numbers, but um, I think there was about six logs at, at the time. And one of them wasn't exactly, I think two or, Two or three of them weren't exactly heavy, so some individuals would end up carrying them on on the shoulder themselves, and the rest were, you know, paired up carrying uh, between two, uh, carrying one log, um, and it was a I think it was around four four or five miles. It was I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Careful. Yeah, four or yeah, five miles. I mean, get those logs from A to B, and that was it. Because I think on your course we introduced steeplechase as well, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, the stretcher, that, the stretcher race as well. Yeah, because that was, uh, we, had, we were at the time because um, we were doing some reviews on the training, and uh, so we introduced part of P Company onto the course. Was that in preparation for maybe trying getting the parachute, the, the, the parachuting piece, yeah. over the line? Yeah. yeah. So we we went to P Company because P Company was in Catrick that uh, just started, so all the stuff that came up. So we looked at the stretch of the log and the uh, steeplechase. So I think we made him do the steeplechase twice instead of once and stuff like that. And it is good because it was a great tester. And, it, you know, it, it, it leveled out when you look at all the other sort of um, arduous selection courses. It's a leveler because it, it met mm-hmm. the team side with the stretcher and the log race. Steeplechase is individual. And then you've got the hills phase, which is definitely where you've got no choice. You're on your own. And you got to motivate yourself, and so you're getting a very fit and motivated individual rather than just a team um, sport. And once you finished all those physical tests, Danny, did you get any time off before you moved on to the next part of the course? Uh, apart from the odd weekends, not really. To be fair, um, you know, it was a case of you know get back, um, sort yourself out, so prep for the next day all the time. Um, you got the odd weekends off where you could try and recruit and get your your, your body back. Um, I, th- I think just after test week, we got a bit of time off just to uh, get back, but we were straight back into it like the the following Monday. Um, and uh, like Kev said, you know they introduced the you know the stretcher, but that was they were in they were in segregated parts, so they they put them, you know. Uh, not not by choice. I think they, they actually thought about it. <laughs> um, no, so it they would put, be planned, <laughs> I imagine, Dan. Yeah, so <laughs> they were planned. Um, so the medical week, they put the stretcher race on yeah. Friday. So, yeah. yeah. And then I think the steeplechase was uh, later down the line. It was after yeah. – it was during the OP sort of phase, uh, if I can remember rightly. But, yeah, so – as I said, once, you know, after that log race, we, we didn't have many students left. And I can't remember exactly how many we had left. We probably had around 12 at that time, considering we started with 42 and lost 13 in the sort of the first two weeks through people just saying, I've had enough. Um, uh, so withdrew themselves off the course. Um, after that, test week, we went into sort of the OP planning phase. So um, how to how to construct observation posts. So you're going into your subsurface. So for those listeners out there um, where you dig a hole and you live sort of underground and then your surface OPs would be like you're you're, um, living on top of the ground but using uh, the natural foliage um, or dense foliage to uh, conceal yourself. and so we covered those and procedures, how to construct recce, um, the procedures, how to get in and out, um, you know, covertly uh, into our observation posts on that side. It's interesting to see how the fitness evolved because Kev and I were talking about this the other week there and we're saying that 
In the courses we did, the fitness tended to be preloaded into the pre-select, that initial seven to 10 days. Thereafter, it certainly wasn't as, um, I mean, yours was a lot more formal. And actually, in some cases, you know, the way it spread out a lot, a lot harder um, and a lot more like supervised is probably the word because the only other fitness that we did after we got past the initial pre-select was you would do your three or four days in the classroom and then you go out in the field for two or three days, but you're carrying around about 40 kilograms of kit. And then, for example, on the radio comms week, you'd be going from checkpoint to checkpoint with all that weight. And then so that's how we weeded people out on the fitness side then. So it's a, a different method, but achieved the same results. Yeah, I think so. And, yeah, like, like I, I alluded back, you know, the first couple of weeks was all out in the field. Um you know, so it did have a toll on your body, and I probably can understand why. You know, it's almost like a shock of capture. So your body's like, "Well, what's going on, yeah?" Or your mind's going, "Well, okay, enough's enough." And I think that's probably half the reason thirteen people came off at that time. Uh, you know, it, it was a different. It, it was really structured because it, it was modelled um, how the PSI from. Um, Tutor SAS wanted it, and he was modelling it on you know what he went through on you know the selection for two two in a similar in in a similar vein. But it you know it got the same result. It set a standard bar. So you you set in your aptitude phase. So you you know you getting that person that right person who's got the mental ability to carry on, um, and, and that's what I've seen through the courses now. It, a, you know, uh, the OP and planning phase was structured. Um, we didn't go into too much detail of urban because, as previous um, on your previous podcast, you know the, the Balkans were in the height there. Um, you know, during, I think you were out in the Balkans at the time I was on my course, uh, Colin. So you know that that sort of training was going to come later for those yeah. people that were going out to the Balkans because they went to. Um, uh, Warminster to the um, the recce course down there for Warminster. So, um, so they didn't go into too much depth on our urban phase, uh, but we covered urban um, on that side, and then we moved on uh, to communications week as well. Um, Danny, just just before we move on to the comms week, Danny, I'd just like to ask Kev a quick question because Kev was in a quite an interesting position in that he'd done the old course, and you were sort of uh, DS directing staff, Kev, on the, the new course, the new SDA course. So how much of an influence was the Hereford PSI at that point, Kev, to the design of the course from your perspective? Well, I was I was involved in the course moving from Germany to the UK because I was a, a full screw on that course, and we had to redesign the course. So actually, we played a major part in it because, because ultimately – we were the ones that what we wanted out of it, we had to decide what we wanted because we had to get it agreed as well by TDT, uh, the, the training board for the Royal Artillery. Um, so there was influences from the various PSIs because before that was the parachute regiment. So it was, the field firing was always a big part, a um, massive amount of effort put into the field firing phase. And that was because Jimmy, as he mentioned, obviously parachute background, Steve Adams, parachute background as well. So he's very infantry orientated on that side. Uh, Steve had a lot of experience in OPs as well from his parachute days, uh, parachute regiment days. So he, he he brought a lot to that as well. And obviously lessons learned from, because again, he was in the Falklands. So there was a lot of lessons learned from the Falklands side. On the OP phase, actually, we didn't need anyone to teach us much about OPs because we were, and probably still are, the best at OPs. Because if you can hide a Mexi, which is the size of a big vehicle, in a, in a wood and it disappears, you can hide a small OP. So we actually, we were, and you proved that in the Balkans when you were running your, as a controller, we were probably the best in the armed forces for that. It's an interesting point you brought out there, because uh, Jimmy mentioned the same thing in his podcast when we interviewed him when he was the parachute regiment chief instructor. And he turned around and said he was there to, to bring realism to training and bring his experience to training. Yeah, yeah. But he also said it wasn't up to him to select our guys. That no. was down to us. And, and and that seems to be a recurring theme even with the Hereford instructors. Which yeah, is, well, that's a fair one. Yeah. I mean, well, I was, I was 
obviously Steve's um, two IC on the course, and he he maintained it throughout as well. It was our course. We have to say, and he would be the arbitrator if there was a a grey area as like a, a bit of a final say. But his strengths, he brought massive strengths to the field firing, to the survival, to the OP phases. He really enjoyed all that, and he he brought a wealth of experience. And then things like OPAC, building OPs and stuff, we also brought a ton of experience. I think there's always a danger, and I was thinking about this the other day, that we always look on the instructors coming brought this massive wealth of experience, but we forget we have to remember that we have a huge amount of operational experience within the battery from the very beginning because the, the first tranches of the uh, selection courses were probably some of the most experienced soldiers in the Royal Artillery. You know, yeah. been to various and with campaigns. a lot of guys from one three eight battery. Yeah, Hereford yeah. even again yeah. back in the yeah. other days, lots of and they were gunners guys. from Hereford as well because some of yeah. them came were the gunners that went to Hereford and come back as gunners. So we had a huge amount of experience, and I think we sometimes forget that in a battery, the training team sometimes is quite pretty, strong, probably very very strong, very experienced training teams. But what you do with another instructor from another cap badge is they bring another strength and another view, especially like I say, Jimmy. Most famous thing, and everyone remembers, is his field firing was as realistic as you can have without someone shooting back at you. You know, he pushed it to the very limits of what you can do on field firing. So you had no doubt what it was going to be like. And so, Danny, then we've sort of, we're always harping on, on in the podcast that, you know, the three main skills of any dismounted soldier are shoot, move, and communicate. As a, that old gem, isn't there? No bombs, no comms. So um, mm-hmm. you're just about to say that you went on to the communication phase. So what did you learn on the comms phase? Yeah, so at this stage is uh, on the communication. We, we learned different types of radios that were employed at that time. Um, probably still employed now, <laughs> to be fair. Um, so d- different types, how to communicate across those radios, how to set them up correctly, uh, effectively uh can uh, conceal your antennas uh, when you're in your your OPs or your observation posts. Um, conceal them and sort of communicate effectively um, and get and fight through the the communication problems when you do have them. So fault finding and, and all that. But um, obviously, it's a very good and I, and I state obvious because you do need communications because if you're not if you're not talking to anyone, there's no point in you being out there. Um, whether that's just relaying information or you know having an effect on the ground, so uh, it it is a vital um, training you know for us at that point. Um, although it was all new to me as I was young, uh, hadn't picked up a radio really before, not really touched it at, uh, at uh, phase two training. So I learned quite a lot at that time. So my learning curve was quite steep when I first came through, um, which, you know, tied in nicely uh, to advanced patrols. So advanced patrols at that time was a confirmation of all what we've learned so far. So bringing in all the skills from what we did in the basic patrols, your OP skills, what you've been taught on, your communication skills, and then, you know, your mental um, resilience as well. So, you know, not forgetting that. Because the advanced patrols was quite cheeky, it was it was around about two weeks um, living in the field. So your planning procedures before you go out, um, it, so your orders process, um, you know, telling the guys what what they're going to do, what they're expected to do, um, you know, the communications, what what's expected back uh, to um, HQ, uh, and then how the how you're going to do your OP procedures as well. I so think as well. Man. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Dan. I, I think as well, just the listeners that not really know a lot about the military. I mean, the the personal discipline that you've got to have and the technical skills you've got to absorb because HF high frequency radio communications is difficult. There's lots of calculations with antennas. You know, some of them it's quite hard to camouflage. You're living in an OP where to be crude, you're crapping into plastic bags and peeing into bottles in a, a, a very, very confined space. Uh, and as you're saying earlier on, Danny, all this wears you down over a period of time. So it's uh, it's not an easy existence, and you find out who the good people are quite quickly. Yeah, no, you, you hit it on the nail there, Colin. Yeah, I mean, all those skills, you know, um, are not 
as I said to you, it was a it's, it was a steep learning curve for myself. Um, and you learn a lot about yourself while you're on the course um, because you get tested. And after advanced patrols, it was sort of straight into it again, um, but more using. Uh, bear in mind, that I haven't actually mentioned this, but you know, going, you know. Once, if we weren't in the field, we were doing obviously lessons uh, in camp. And on the evenings of those lessons, what I haven't actually really covered is each evening we, we did um, AFE recognition. So your armored fighting vehicles. So, you know, obviously trying to identify um, aircraft, um, foreign vehicles, foreign uniforms. So each night we had to do um, recognition on those, uh, which is death by PowerPoint. Um, at that point, it was, it was hard taking that all in as well, uh, because it, you know, trying to remember all those vehicles and aircrafts is, is, uh, quite, and you're getting tested on it as well. So there was a test on it every time. Um, I but, so yeah, so yeah, yeah I think it's fair to say that, I mean, the way the course was structured, it, it was meant to be, Full on from the start point to the end. There was there was no like period where you're gonna have like a dip week where it's a nice easy week. You could just you know recover and all the rest of it. So in camp we wanted to make sure that after the evening meal there was a further lesson. Then after that you had to go away and start get, keep your kit up to date, prepare equipment, look after your equipment because in the following week you're going to be back out in the field again or doing something else. But it, the idea was to to be demanding all the time so it was a mental resilience even in camp you had to keep pushing yourself because it wasn't going to be an easy day now as you can see mate you were you're talking about um moving on to sort of the observation post training the opiac train observation post assistant to be full yeah yeah so yeah after advanced patrols we moved on to opiac so uh, this for our, our listeners out there is the ability to call in um, artillery fire and have an effect on the, the enemy. So, you know, barrel them with um, HE rounds, so high explosive rounds. Um, this was your, uh, it was uh, a level two course, um, and it was a bit of a flash to bang as well. Uh, it was actually taught by um, uh, Lee Chapman you've had on the the uh, podcast who at that time was a, a sergeant and a, a a very scary man but yeah for me he was um but uh, yeah I, I had to go through it a few times to be honest because you know I've never never experienced it it was all new to me completely new to me um we were in um a simulated environment um and it tied in nicely to the Q- communication so the voice procedures that we had to deliver um and with my accent trying to get a voice procedure done uh, is quite difficult at times um at that point because my accent was really strong at that um <laughs> at that time so yeah so uh thank goodness lee was patient with me at that time uh, and uh, got and i got through that but um that sort of phase um which was good and it was really good to you know see you know what what effect you can have on the ground and what speed it can as well by just you know having the right communication and the right procedures but yeah it was um, a really good package that way um slightly different nowadays and how it's uh, um, done and it's not done actually in the course but that that was on the course at the time uh, when i went through we moved nicely into survival so we we're talking about uh around week 10 now uh who was taught by obviously Monster Adams, the Hereford PSI, um, and as I said, he was he was I think this is what his niche was. He he liked survival, um, so we spent uh, a week in the field again, learning how to build shelters, um, how to skin, how to just survive off the land with the bare minimum and just a knife, effectively. I think Monster, he, I can remember one time he he. Uh, well, one of his many times, he, he said, right, if you don't have a knife, um, and he had this rabbit in his hand, and he, he actually said, right, there's other ways to get it, and he went to the gut of the rabbit and, and bit into it, and that's how he was skinning it. And I was a bit <laughs> like, I don't know if that's normal, but yeah. Um, <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> quite a shock when, you, when you're 70, what, what's that man doing? Uh, but yeah, um, 
some of the bits that stuck in my and, and will always stick in my head from that course. Uh, but yeah, it was a, a great. We learned how to navigate, you know, using the stars, sketch maps. Um, we did uh, night navs um, with you know improvised uh, compasses uh, and build traps and stuff. So it was really good. Although it was a short package, you got a lot from it and how to survive with the bare minimum. After that, we moved into uh, field firing. So going back in, so field firing covered um, different weapon systems that are in service at that time. So um, and small team tactics, how to use them, small team tactics uh, skills. So your snap shoots, um, jimpy, your pistol. Uh, probably, you know, the pistol is probably not the one that gets used by the soldiers that much. Uh, but we did as because you need every bit of uh, firepower working in small teams um, in that depth sort of uh, environment that you're working in. Um, but yeah, it was again, um, Monster taught us a lot. Uh, this is completely new to me. Firing techniques, I, I didn't know I could get into, you know, different ways, um, which, you know, in the end, you, you do a four-man sort of um, evacuation drill where someone goes down uh, and then you, you extract him under sort of fire and cover, and, which was really good um, on that and you're side. you're doing this at night and day as well, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it covers that at night. And it gets, it, it gets really, I mean, as the listeners can imagine, it gets very restrictive at night because you can't see much. Um, so you've got to be you know, aware of your surroundings and who's around you as well, especially when it's uh, live ammunition. Yeah. And I think, as Kev touched on earlier, I think that's the benefit of having people like Jimmy and Monster with their backgrounds. I mean, uh, I think Monster had been at Goose Green mm. and, and and Jimmy had been in Longdon. Yeah. So these guys, you know, absolute top-class pedigree to teach live firing. No, exactly. And they've got that experience, as you said, because that operational experience, uh, I think, yeah, in the Falklands, which is good. Um, and lastly, um, you know, coming to sort of the end of my uh, course or selection at, at that time was the final exercise. So the final exercise comprised of everything, everything you've been taught. And this is just, a, I think, more of a confirmation for the instructors to assess you for the final time that you've taken everything that you've learnt on the course. So your your communications, your OP skills, you know, your weapon handling, um, how you, you operate in a small team, you know, um, your orders, everything combined. And, and they tested you on that, on that side, uh, on the final, which was around 10 days, which, um, Ended up at the end with a a uh, extraction. So going through your your DAR system, if um, you know if you were behind enemy lines, if if you want to call it that. But yeah, that 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 was um, a, a brief insight of what I went into, um, what I what I can certainly remember during that time, because <laughs> uh, as I said at the beginning, it was a shock of capture. <laughs> and, and, a lot and, of people just... forget, and a lot of people forget as well that just got you to the basic level the whole course would give you the basic special observer qualification because you still had more to come through continuation training that's a really great point Kev I think that arduous process Danny's just described was just to enable you to go in and be a patrol member so it's you know it's your yeah. apprenticeship yeah. effectively. Yeah, yeah, ba- yeah. It got you to that base to the basically the course gets you to the start line. That's all it did. Got you to the start line. Then you got your continuation training. Build yourself up into the patrols. Go up through the ranks. Get the qualifications. Go on operations. So the fourteen week selection course from flash the bank got you to the start point, and then it all started. And then it was continuous from then on. So did anybody fail at that point, Danny? Was anybody unlucky enough to get a fail at that point after being all the way through that? Yeah, there were um, three three individuals that failed that part of the course at that final point because, yeah, you. I mean, the whole I think it was sixteen weeks in total, uh, and you're always you're always getting assessed. Um, it's kind of it, it, once you get through the flow of it, you know, like any. Um, any sort of arduous course that you go through or any course you go through, um, you sort of forget, 
you know what you know the bad times and you're just going through the momentum so as long as you are going through you're doing the right things and turning up at the right time and you know ticking the right boxes if you want to call it that um yeah so yeah seven of us passed in the end um you know mighty seven you know badging parade uh, to get your special observer badge wasn't um it's never been a, like a massive parade i don't think and I, it's not it's not even a massive parade today it's always a, a sort of covert parade um you know between you know, a small bunch of battery members because remember that time uh, well you'll know colin you know the guys were away in the balkans a lot at, at that point as well but i think that's one of the great things about the battery it just sums up that key uh low key attitude the battery has you know and there's no big fuss made about it and all of a sudden you're in but you must have felt as i did and kev did mate you do feel a huge sense of achievement and pride after being through that that whole selection process no no it was a massive it was a massive high um uh, and i still remember it yeah it's just it's a massive high but like like i said it's not a big song and dance it's it just kept uh, amongst a small bunch of a small a small group yeah so kev we're going to move on to the course today mate yeah yeah so i mean so danny in com- obviously there's a quick comparison between what you went through and the courses of you know the mid 90s to today's course um what what what's it what does it look like in comparison well kev as i said um you know the output's still the same so we're still trying to get the the same person uh in in terms of the aptitude and the, the quality through. So the standard hasn't effectively changed. How we do it is not dissimilar to the course I went through. There's, there's subtle changes. There's more, you know, nowadays because of safety and everything. So there's more stringent safety procedures that we go through, uh, you know, to make sure that the individuals, you know, trained to a realistic environment and kept and keeping that standard. Um like you mentioned before, you know, the, the course is now progressive, um, too dissimilar from mine. So developing the, the soldier's strength, you know, endurance, stamina, and getting the, the person with the right aptitude in order to operate in, on their own uh, in in harsh environment or um, in a difficult, challenging situation. Um, and that's what we're still trying to achieve nowadays. I think, yeah, that. I think I think you're looking for the same person because it's the same attributes, isn't it? That individual who can who's got resilience, who can get on with it on his own because if they're separated, they've got no choice. They can't just sit down and think, well, I don't know what to do. And I think those, even back to the stay behind period when the concept was first thought of, those were the sort of things: determination, resilience, mental resilience, as well as physical, and and a. I think throughout, and I know throughout your course, one of the things we did was push people to give them that strength, that self belief. A certain training was, you know, like the survival training. You can survive with nothing, and if you get that mentally into someone's head, they become more, much stronger mentally when it all goes a bit pee tong. Yeah, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know. The- the course still does, you know, the aptitude phase, the heels phase now, uh, but it's more, it's more progressive. They spend a lot more time uh, on on navigation um, and building their sort of uh, resilience or their physical um, sort of um, stamina up, you know, for endurance. So th- it's all, you know, done in the same place now. So, um, and they go on test week in the same place. So they get an understanding of what they're going into uh, more more now. But the, the standard's still the same. We still do, uh, you know, the 10-miler uh, and followed by the, the um, individual Navexes afterwards with an endurance. Um, but, you know, unlike mine, it's 14 weeks now. So it's not – it's although it's still intense. Easy then, 14 gone. weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you still it's still intensive you're still trying mm. to cover the same thing um but you know it's the continuation it's been a bit training. more clever as well i think so I, I think the course has got more intelligent and clever in the way it's been run over the years but it initially started out as a very blunt instrument and we've just got clever more clever and 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 you're still producing the same product but you've been far more clever about how you go about it 
Yeah, and uh, I think you know things change, society changes. You know, you know people coming through now are not you know not saying they don't have the aptitude. They're probably just you know everyone expects things given to them, I suppose. Um, so you know to get the right type of soldier nowadays needs a bit more patience. Um, and I, I think it's you know it's probably better that way because we get the individual to learn a lot more. Well, it's interesting to note, mate, that since 1982 when the unit was raised, there's only been 350 badge people, and that was on the Battery's Instagram site a couple of months ago, and I was gobsmacked. I thought it would be a lot more than that. There's only ever been 350 people required, which shows you how small the unit is. But looking at the shrinking manpower pool, I mean, Army's going to go down to, what, 70,000 in the next couple of years? I think it is. It's about 72,000 or something. Yeah, roughly around that. That's what the uh, press is saying, yeah. So you, you've also got the new Ranger Regiment. I think compared to mine and Kev's day, there's far more opportunities out there for a young soldier. I mean, basically one of the reasons I went to the battery was because I asked for transfers to different units and couldn't get them. And it was one of the ways I could get into doing something that was good. But do you reckon things like the new Ranger Regiment and could prove a threat to the battery's recruitment? No, I don't I don't think so because you've got to remember that the guys – they offer a lot more in terms of, you know, what they have to go through um, to be a qualified. You get the basic standards, so you're selecting already. Um, so you're getting that right sort of person. I, I say selecting. You're getting that right type of person on that patrols course um, to give you that basic standard. And then the continuation training, that the, what the guys have to go through after the course is – is immense you know they still go through so they do uh, you know a, a photography course two weeks um straight off the course then they go you know your your escape and evasion which uh was mentioned in your your previous podcasts um you still have to go through that um and that's another two weeks on top of that so you you're adding more so effectively you need 21 weeks just to be you know re- you know, at that level of training. Uh, and I think that's what gives the, the higher commander, you know, that warm, fuzzy feeling that they can send the guys off. And bear in mind that the, the guys, today's patrol soldiers now, they go through with the same, you know, infantry pairing as the Ranger Regiment. So they'll, they'll attend junior Brecken, which is like 16 weeks, you know, and the, the warmest, the light, uh, light reconnaissance uh, patrols um, school done at Warminster they'll they'll do eight weeks down there as well um and that gives you credibility to stand with these guys doesn't it which I think before and I touched on this in the podcast with the Balkans where we turned up with the Royal Green Jackets and they didn't we were an unknown quantity yeah but I think going on junior breaking going on the uh the recce course gives you not only does it give you the skills but you meet other people yeah which I think is important yeah and and yeah yeah I think as a gonna base regiment uh, bat a unit as well, even though it's an all arms unit, it's still gonna cap badge lead, you are sometimes fighting for more credibility than other than other say infantry or cav units in that spectrum. Yeah, I mean you yeah I think Kev, what you do is you get to uh, I think the, the patrol soldiers now get to, you know, assess their abilities against uh, you know yeah. where where probably previously before we we uh, probably um, were self licking lollipop if you want to call that. So we, we assessed ourselves with internally. And now we can assess ourselves uh, externally um, yeah. by, you know, attending all these courses. I'm not saying we didn't do that previously. We just we do it, do it more overtly now, I, I suppose. Uh, I, I and think it that's gets, a great point, Danny. Absolutely yeah. spot on point. And, and I and it gets it gets it gets our name out as well now for recruiting, I suppose, as well. And people go, all oh, right, who are they? And it, yeah, the cap badge, you know. You join in the artillery, and everyone thinks, "Okay, you're gonna you're gonna call in bombs and that." But it's not it's not the case, you know. The, the guys are doing completely adverse roles, you know, uh, from you know sniping what we used to do back mm. in you know in Iraq, um, Kev. So the guys go on those courses, um, you know. It's immense the courses that they have to go through uh, just Plus, to be qualified just for that risk. Because what we do forget is the the uh, 
the joint fires capability. So you've got yeah. a small team that's giving you a massive effect on the ground. Yeah. So not just you know telling you where the enemy is. It's it's also giving you the ability to have an effect on the ground with you know um, offensive support. So I'm talking about aircraft, um, aircraft and artillery fire. Yeah, I mean, so, guys are hugely qualified, man. One of the statistics that you told me that really brought this home was the fact that the battery is more light recce role qualified people than an infantry recce company. You yeah. also do JTAC training. You're the guys are also going away and doing jungle warfare and Arctic warfare training. Yeah. So there's, yeah. there's all that as well. So when you take this, the, the, you use the term when we're talking uh, the other week there, uh, Danny, about zero to hero. But I mean, the, the sheer quantity of the training the guys do is, is amazing. So although the equipment has greatly changed, and along with the technology as well. Uh, one thing that hasn't changed, it needs to be carried on your back. And, you know, <laughs> you talked about the fitness that still needs to be done. The fact that guys are still tabbing around the hills as part of the selection course. Yeah. The basic skills there, you know, the ability to shoot, move, and communicate to very high standard, that is never going to change. Any dismounted soldier needs to have those really high skills. So with the sheer amount of qualification needed, as we've just discussed, the training burden must be considerable. Is that a challenge? Yeah, it, it is. It is a challenge for you know a, a small unit, and a, and a, you know it's it's been small in your days as well, Colin. So it's always a challenge to try and you know get these guys. You know, you're always chasing them. The training burden's immense in terms of trying to keep the guys qualified because they have to be current and competent, um, and you've got to justify that current and competency. Um, you know, on, on, on various exercises. So, yeah, the training burden is, is – on an individual, what they have to go through is is quite immense in terms of um, keeping current. So I think, Kev, we'll leave the summing up to you there because, uh, as you said earlier on, you straddled sort of both eras, if you like. So if you just want to sum up a couple of things there for us. I think that the course over the last, let's say, 39 years of our unit's history, which which sounds like a long time, but actually is – the military is tiny. It's 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 adapted from the stay behind role to that of today's twenty first century STA patrols. It maintains the same qualities that we had in nineteen eighty two and what was looked for then, even though the role has and I think the role has expanded hugely, as has the qualifications and the expectations from the commander and what they can do. I think the stay behind role was very, very niche uh, in comparison. Um, I, you, I think it's a far more exciting job. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, ours was very. It was it was one job. Our job was to go forward, stay behind the lines, identify targets, smash them, and it, hopefully some of us may have got back to our own lines. But your the twenty first century special observer has a whole range of skills and on operations they can do in a wider variety. And and this started obviously when we were in the Balkans when we moved out the. The Northern Ireland only tours to the Balkans. We had to be start becoming more and more adaptable as patrol commanders to look for work sometimes, and and that's the model that's continued from the early nineties when we started doing that through to now the the twenty first century soldiers. And because no operation, I don't think it was said before, you train for an operation in one way. When you go on the operation, you do something totally different, and you've got to remain that flexible. And as usual, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dits, which is the, where the guest picks a favourite military book, a film, and luxury item. So, Danny, what's yours? Uh, well, um, there's a lot of favourite books, uh, but I think for the listeners, just to get a bit, a bit, a bit more background on some of the operational uh, stuff that the battery's done, there's a book called The Operational Snake Bite. Um, which is uh, by Stephen Gray, um, who sort of wrote uh, his, um, the book on a the siege or the retake of Musakala and how the process went through that and and interviewing different um, units that were involved in that, so the Americans uh, and and so on. And there's a there's a nice little piece in there of um, the battery uh, when they were doing BRF. Um, which will give an insight to some of the operations, uh, and then you get to see a picture of me as well uh, in the in the book as well. That's a uh, reason for not buying it, mate. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> probably a good reason to to not buy it. But uh, yeah, um, you know, and it, it just highlights, you know, that you know, 
what the the, the battery went through during um, Afghan um, on the desert patrol. Um, so yeah, um, worth a worth a read uh, just to get a bit of background, more a bit more background for the listeners out there. Mm. Yeah, and your film? Oh, film. Uh, so yeah, I've I've listened to the other podcasts and I, I'm I'm split between it, yeah. Um, a lot, but I think I'm going to have to go with the modern day sort of versions, um, which is uh, Saving Private Ryan. Um, which, uh, but I'm split between Tears of the Sun. That's you've that's ruined it now, mate. You should have stuck to your first choice, not brought <laughs> that one in. But yeah, Saving Private Ryan is probably my best film. I think <laughs> uh, it gives you a realistic uh, view of um, you know the battlefield in um, the Second World War, um, especially the beach landing. So yeah, was, yeah, that's one of my favorite films i suppose um and i suppose my luxury item uh if i was to get stuck on a, a desert island i'll be stuck anyway i know everyone's uh gone for a for a drink um uh, and i'd love to take a drink but i want to survive don't i if i was stuck on there so <laughs> Stop I've, being got, practical, Danny. <laughs> I've got i've gone i've gone with my basic issue survival knife um which is a nice meaty one to keep me uh keep me survive surviving i suppose you can blame kev for that if i'm being <laughs> practical on that front but yeah hey, kev they're getting spoiled now mate they're getting issues survival now. we had to buy our own what's all that about <laughs> i don't know i have to think myself <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my recommendation this week is 18 platoon by sydney jerry and this book was required reading at sanders at one point and offers an excellent perspective of war from a platoon commander's level it's a short book of only 132 pages, so if you haven't got much patience for reading, it's a, it's a great way to, to get a perspective on it. So he was born in 1924 and joined the Buffs as a private in 1942. He commissioned into the Hampshire Regiment in 43. And from July 44 to 45, he was a platoon commander in the 4th Battalion, the Somerset Light, Light Infantry in Northwest Europe. And he won an MC, so he obviously had something about him. He does come across as a bit arrogant and cocksure of himself, but he's well respected by his soldiers, and this is an evidence when as is one of his full screws wrote the foreword to the book. It's interesting to note that the chances of surviving the war in Europe as an officer at that time were slim, but he survived the fighting in Normandy and all the way through the end to Bremen, and it covers fighting in the Bocage, the race to relieve the Paris at Arnhem, the crossing of the Seine, and the discovery of Belsen. He's also very good at the details of what makes the soldiers of a democratic army tick in war. And towards the end of the book, he outlines what he thinks makes the ideal infantryman, which is sufferance, the ability to endure, a quiet mind, enabling a person to live in harmony with others, a sense of ridiculousness, which helps a soldier surmount the unacceptable, and finally, a reasonable standard of fitness and dedicated professional competence. And I think, looking back at what we have just discussed, that pretty much sums up the... Uh, requirements of an OP troop soldier. Mm, so it's also yeah. one of the first books I read I read that dismantled the image of the invincible German soldier. And Jerry is very good at pointing out the failings of the Germans in the war, noting that they didn't like fighting at night and didn't put out many offensive patrols. He also questioned the value of fighting patrols, which is an ethos of the British Army, which he often thought didn't achieve much. Cost valuable NCOs and were left over from World War One. So you get some good perspectives there. And he always used to feature in the British Army Review back in the 80s and 90s. And one of the things he said back then was that the Bren carrier, a little light vehicle, was always indispensable to an infantry platoon. And you saw a sort of version of that come out in Afghanistan with the use of quad bikes and trailers. So his thoughts were pretty relevant. Kev, what's uh, yours this week? Yeah, mine is uh, Phantoms of the Jungle by D.M. Hona. And this is the, the history of the formation of the Australian SAS post-Second World War. Um, it's been published twice. I've only ever read the first version, which took up to the 20th century, but they've done a later one with an extra couple of uh, chapters. And this is based on patrol reports and interviews with individuals who, who were there from the RSMs, the COs, and some of the some of the soldiers as well. And it tells a story of the formation of the SES. And it seems to be a, a common trend that post-Second World War, all the specialist sort of units after the end of the Second World War were disbanded like everyone else, and the armies went back to pre-Second World War sort of uh, structures. And then these small wars and campaigns started opening up in the 50s, post-Korea, in Malaya, Borneo. And then all the nations that were seen to be involved in it needed to have some kind of 
deep penetration patrols or specialist patrols to operate in these sort of insurgencies rather than these large formation um, groups. And so the Australian SAS was formed after the British SAS was formed in Malaya. Um, and they obviously did that. They had a secret role in Borneo during the confrontation with Indonesia. And then it led to uh, a more sustained footprint and, and, and it enlarged as well when Australia um, went into Vietnam with the Americans. And that's what it embedded that um, organization and it's a full strength in the australian piece so the book itself it's it's, it's, lo- it's a lot of vignettes um from various patrols talking about operating beyond enemy lines conducting surveillance uh in borneo then moving on to um their, their action with the Viet Cong um, and working out there it, it does talk about the formation a little bit about the, some of the politics of when when they were trying to form, there was obviously there's always resistance to specialized units, and I think post Second World War there was always a a reluctance to to raise another regiment. They were part of the Royal Australian Regiment as a specialist company, and I didn't realise how small the Australian Army or Defence Force was post Second World War. They had a civilian sort of force which could mobilise because of because of obviously the, the sheer size of the Australian continent versus the post second world war population size a really interesting book to see the start of a uh, uh, the, the australian special forces and how they formed them from the 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 uh, various units that were left after the after the second world war in the australian defense force but like i said the bit i haven't read is the 21st century part because i haven't got that in my book and quite controversial, mate, judging by recent happenings. Oh, well, I was going to say, yeah, absolutely. I think they're going to have a review. Well, they are being reviewed, aren't they? And how are they going to operate in the future, become the tip of the spear again? But that leads me to say thank you to our guest and to you, the listener, for your support and suggestions. Please keep them coming. And our email and social media links are at the bottom of the, of the show notes. You can find us on all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and whatever other social networking site you would like. If you have downloaded us from iTunes and like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a review. And this is the best way of bringing the attention to the series. Thank you again to Nick Beale for his continuing support and sponsorship to the series and offering technical support through his company, ISAR. Mm-hmm.